Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Roberta Kochi, and I'm one of the directors of Latitudes, the online marketplace for art from Africa. Tonight's topic is um, most certainly an interesting one, and we're so glad to have had such a good response, so thank you for that. Um, and we're particularly honored to have renowned journalist, art critic, and editor, Sean O'Toole, host the talk for us. He will be in conversation with the two custodians of the Billy Monk Collection, Gavin Furlonger and Craig Cameron McIntosh. On behalf of Latitudes, I'd like to thank the South African Friends of the Israel Museum with whom we've partnered on this talk, as well as the Billy Monk Collection, and of course, Sean, Gavin and Craig for sharing their insights into the life and practice of this most intriguing South African photographer. Before I hand over to Sean, um, I would like to mention that tonight's discussion is taking place in celebration of the fact that 10 previously unpublished photographers by photographs by Monk have become available to the public. The exhibition, which we've titled Unseen, comprises 10 limited edition portraits, which are now available exclusively on Latitudes. We will be sharing the link to view and purchase these works during and after the talk. And of course, we'll be discussing some of these unseen portraits in more detail this evening. I'm sure we'll all have questions along the way. So please be sure to pop them in the chat and we'll try our best to answer them all. And um, that's enough from me though. Thank you and enjoy the evening. Over to you, Sean. Thanks, Roberta. Um, let me start by firstly, I received an email today. It was from Latitudes and it said it was Latitudes Online's first birthday. So happy <laughs> birthday. Thank you so much. <laughs> Last week, entirely unprompted, I was chatting to a collector and he mentioned um, that he absolutely loves um, latitudes as a way of discovering unknown artists. So it's a real compliment to you. I think what you and Lucy and the team have achieved in the last two years. So anyway, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm not gonna do the introductions. I'm gonna slip away the, the main act here is Gavin and Craig, and I suppose the larger than life Billy Monk. So um, Roberta, maybe it's a good time to play just a short little introductory video before we start talking. Better. Um, I suppose in that little preamble, what becomes clear is that we're looking at Billy Monk's photographs. We're not seeing Billy Monk himself. So that leads in directly to my first question. I'm not going to do niceties. Let's get into a discussion. That's why we're here. Um, so I would like to ask both Gavin and Craig to introduce Billy. Who is Billy Monk? in your own words. So Gavin, start with you. Okay, so I remember a fleeting visit uh, to Billy Monk's leather shop in Long Street, I suppose late 68, early 69. Uh, leather man, quite a salty looking guy, seafaring sort of guy. Um, nothing in particular, um, but yeah. Uh, later on, um, I think weighing up when all when finally I was starting to work with the the archives, Billy Monk archives. You know, more and more, one became aware of what was going on inside his head. 
and uh, he was a man who wore many caps. So, I mean, in, in listening to all the stories about Billy Monk, and they're all true, um, he was a failed petty robber and got caught with the, the safe in his hand at OK Bazaars and got jailed for a couple of years. <laughs> that was the kind of start of the story or the journey. Uh, he was a crayfish poacher. I have it on a... Uh, from one of his friends who used to uh, row the boat with him out just off Robin Island, okay? And he spent a lot of time in um, Port Knollis as a, a diamond diver, which apparently was quite a, um, quite a popular pad, okay, for people. Um, and uh, apart from that, he was by nature a pugilist, he was a bouncer by night, and eventually, uh, almost overnight, he became this amazing photographer. Um, and it's very clear that he, to me, was uh, probably an incurable romantic and certainly uh, a complete charmer. The ladies just swooned for him. Uh, and uh, as long as you didn't give him any reason to beat the crap out of you, you'd have a good time with Billy. <laughs> uh, so that's where I get it from at this point. Over to you, Craig. <laughs> yes, uh, like, like Gavin said, Billy Monk was uh, kind of a jack of all trades. And he, he came from quite a rough background. So he really was in that underground world and tried his hand at many different short careers. I mean, if you can call being a poacher and a thief a career. But um, then what brought him to the catch games was was being uh, a bouncer at the club and other underground sailor clubs. And I believe that he was, he either traded or bought an um, old Pentax from one of the Taiwanese or Japanese sailors that came to Cape Town before going to the deep Atlantic for fishing for sushi, uh, which was starting to become popular around the world. Um, and so now he was presented with this, this, uh, a new world of this underground sailor world, but also with photography. And um, he tried his hand at it and just had a natural skill and a, a great eye for it. And it was another career that he, he tried his hand at and, that, and he was good at. And just when, you know, he was starting to get into the swing of things, the whole landscape of, of the shipping industry changed and containerization meant that Sailors weren't really required to stay for weeks at a time in Cape Town and the nightlife in the dockside dried up. And so Billy moved on to the next thing um, to, to try and make some money. And that was diamond diving in on the West Coast uh, in Port Nolith. So, yeah, he just really moved through life uh, trying his hand at different things. And it's a pity that he didn't get to, to do more photography because he really was talented. Um, but... I think the point is that he, what he photographed was he was part of this this world, and I think that's what separates him from a lot of a lot of photographers who who try and venture into this CD underworld in various cities. Um, is that he was really a part of it? He was he was this rough character who wasn't afraid and um, knew the people that he photographed. A quick biographical question. Uh, when and where was he born? Because the photographs are so much about a particular moment in Cape Town. Was he born in Cape Town? Gavin? Uh, he was in, um, as far as I understand, his family life started in Johannesburg. Okay. So, um, um, you know, maybe he found his way down here. I'm not sure at what stage of the game. Um, so, yeah, but uh, he wasn't a Cape Townian at heart, or he was, he behaved as a Cape Townian at heart, <laughs> but I don't think he originated from here. So. I suppose another just uh, question that frames the conversation, um, how long was he active as a photographer, if you had to date it? What were the years? Uh, I would say 67 to 69. Very uh, short. Very short period. He was... Um, he had a luck. He he met a a, a very uh, well known photographer at the time, social photographer, one of the highlights, Paul Gordon, 
you had a studio and a dark room in Long Street. And somehow they'd connected. And um, I think that by virtue of that introduction, Paul let him come to his dark room in the middle of the night or pretty much any time to come and develop his film and print out the pictures. And he probably helped him to, to teach him how to do exactly that. So, I mean, Billy was, uh, was pretty proactive. He not only took the pictures by night, he then spent the rest of the night processing, developing, and printing snappy pictures. I'm not sure. Unfortunately, there are no surviving uh, examples of the pictures that he used to sell to the sailors or to anybody who was interested, you know? which was, after all, the, the main reason for him shooting these pictures was to make extra money. Uh, somehow, though, that is not something that uh, one one really takes from that. I think, you know, as happy snaps as one might call them, they're uh, incredibly sophisticated uh, and uh, beautifully composed, and they compare with the Diane Arbuses of this world, the Vivian Mayers, uh, and uh, any of those paparazzis on the go, except that he made them... They had his right handwriting, if you like, his style. And whenever he pointed a camera, uh, which is clear to see, at anyone or any group or whatever, they all absolutely played to the camera, which to me means that he either probably already in a short time built up uh, a reputation for, you know, phew, if Billy shoots you, you're going to get a good picture whatever that may be, but it's, it feels like that must have been the case. He must have developed uh, a strong personality as a photographer, besides the bouncer, of course. <laughs> I'd like to perhaps just give uh, people that are viewing a sense of your stake in uh, the images that we're seeing here and why we're seeing them. So, Gavin, you, um, you're a photographer. You're yeah. a photography dealer, you're also an archivist, and you've started uh, the, let me read the correct title, the Photographic Archival and Preservation Association, or PAPA. PAPA. <laughs> That's how I met you. You were introducing yes. me to Ginger Oates and also later Johan Kuss. Um, when did you first come to Billy Monk, the photographer? Craig, I'll get to you in a moment. Um, well, obviously, I was, became aware of him when uh, he had his first exhibition at, well, not his first, but a first exhibition by uh, Michael Stevenson in Cape Town. And um, so that's when I first became aware of so that, his work. That's fairly recent. It would be in the last decade. Yeah. Okay. So, and then it transpired from there. I somehow got caught up and involved by virtue of his son, David, coming to me uh, very unhappy, as he always was, as it turned out. <laughs> so, you know, there was nothing new about that. But he was a hard man to please, you could put it that way. Uh, so, I don't know, after about three years of kind of trying to help him, but saying, leave me out of the picture, but, you know, this is what you should do, and this is how you should treat it, and don't worry, and all that kind of stuff. Then he, his uh, sister came along and said, um, uh, enough of that, you're going to be our curator and custodian from now on. So that wasn't what it might seem. I didn't inherit just a box for files full of pictures. I inherited his family. His son, his daughter, and his ex-wife. So for six years, it was an interesting <laughs> journey. Uh, and uh, very little thanks given, other than I'm very happy that we maintained all this time. I'm very happy that Craig and Carl came along to uh, offer support on the sales side of things and to help to jack the whole profile up. Um, you know, my main thing is making sure that we preserve what I, I personally consider to be very important photography that has a legacy to our heritage. 
it shows and you see billy monk's work uniquely nobody else that i know has ever come up with making nightlife as uh seductive and sexy as he did you know uh, i spent uh, a couple of years uh in the early days uh working on a magazine called time out being a, a restaurant photographer with a bum freezer and a camera and a and a order book which was quite humiliating stuff because they really <laughs> jacked you off and made you suffer and sit and wait and i got very little very little joy there um until i, well, I became an assistant one day so you know and I've spent a long time as a photographer and have come across most photographers. And I was just sad to see that a lot of that important work was disappearing. So that's when I stepped in with Papa in uh, 2000. If I could turn to you, Craig, what is a figurative painter, someone who's won the Sunland Portrait Award, congrats. What is a painter making a documentary about the photographer? Why? Well, how did that all come about? How did you meet up with Gavin? What drew you to Billy? So, sure, I moved to Cape Town in 2007, and I actually studied filmmaking, directing and script writing and cinematography and post-production. Um, and painting came later. But I, since moving to Cape Town, I had become aware of Billy Monk's photographs, but I wasn't actually sure of, of his name. And my partner, Kyle, kept on describing these amazing photographs. And a few of them popped up here and there um, because about 50 photographs of his were in circulation and popped up in various publications and group exhibitions and at Stevenson Gallery. Um, and then when I started to learn more about Billy Monk, uh, we found out that they were on display at Gallery F. So we that's where we met Gavin and that's where we bought these two hanging up um, and it was just yeah we started to learn more and more about him and it was quite it was quite nice to know that there was an archive there was more to the his portfolio than what had been published and yeah so this is this is the book that Stevenson published and it, it only contains 47 of his images and to learn that there was more to the archive was quite exciting so I didn't set about to to go into this as you know as an archive as archivist and uh, to to create this documentary. It just sort of happened naturally, and it made sense. And it was an exciting project to to come on board and to to have a look in the archive and see what other photos there were. So when when we had the entire catalog or the, all the his negatives uh, digitized. It was a little bit, uh, yeah, it was exciting, but I was concerned that perhaps the reason since 1982 that only 50 photographs were in circulation was that maybe it was a fluke or uh, that, you know, the rest were out of focus or not interesting. And it was it was quite exciting to, to uncover all these amazing images still in the archive that just hadn't seen light <laughs> since, you know, 50 years prior. So we came on board with Gavin and we formed the, the Billy Monk collection just to, first of all, ensure that the negatives remain in good condition and are looked after and, and kept, uh, kept safely. Um, and then from there, yeah, we, we came up with the idea to launch at the Cape Town Art Fair in 2019, which was, it was quite nice timing because that was the, the 50th anniversary of the majority of the, of the archives. So it was 50 years since they had been photographed uh, and the CTICC in Cape Town is actually you know, a, a couple of blocks away from where the photographs were taken. So it all came together nicely and that led to making the documentary and using what I had studied to help tell his story. Well, I think it's a good opportunity to maybe look at a clip of the documentary and then we can briefly talk about it afterwards. Or would you think it's better to do a little preamble, Craig? Do you want to give any words just before we watch a clip? Um, well, just to say that it was, it was intended to be, to accompany any exhibitions, to give a, a nice summary of who Billy Monk was. 
And I had in mind something eight to ten minutes that could play in a gallery that uh, people could just come and sit and watch and come and go and, and learn learn more. Um, and as we started to uncover more subjects to interview and you know uncovering more research and going through letters written by Billy Monk, it, it became clear that this was more than just an eight minute uh, informative clip. So it just grew into, it's 35 minutes, so it's, it's, it is short and sweet, but it, it could have been longer. It, it's a fascinating story. And so, yeah, my, my idea was just to, to create an informative, uh, short and sweet documentary without veering into a marketing video. So I, I wanted to keep it um, authentic. And it also became quite apparent while we were creating this film that it's the, it was just the right time because, as I said, the photographs are 50 years old and many of the subjects are, are, have passed away. And since making the film, um, three of the people that I've interviewed have passed away. So it's, it's an important, it was an important time to get, get it into film format and at, at very least get some, some documentary uh, footage and interviews uh, of, of a time that, you know, not many people know about. Uh, in Cape Town's history. I think, I think, Roberta, that's a good prompt to show. Thanks, Roberta. I think one of the things about the documentary is um, the breadth of commentators you got, um, but they may not be self-evident to everyone. So, Craig, maybe if you could talk about um, Lynn Sampson, the journalist Lynn Sampson that you interviewed and why you interviewed her. So, Lynn Sampson wrote this amazing article for the Sunday Times in, in 1982 called Now You've Gone and Killed Me. Uh, this is an anthology of, of some of her articles. And it's, it's just it's, the way she writes is so it's descriptive and beautiful and uh, interesting. And so uh, her, her article became the backbone of the story. Um, it, it was set up in, in certain interesting way it was kind of set up like a like a piece of cinema um, you couldn't even script the stuff that 
that happened in the story. So it was great to get Lynn on board and, and I had many meetings with her and even before we got to actually filming her. And so yeah, she was an important part of the whole process and uh, kind of dictated a lot of where, where we went with who we spoke to next, uh, filling in the gaps and mm -hmm. uh, reiterating what she had said, but getting the first hand um, comments from the people that were involved wherever possible. And um, yeah, then towards the end of, of post-production, when we had all these great interviews, uh, then we just tied it together by getting her to come into studio and read excerpts from her, from her article. And it just added a sense of, um, you know, sort of drama to the, the story uh, in, the, in the amazing words that how she put the story. Mm -hmm. Gavin, maybe if you could speak about um, the colleague, Jacques de Villiers, who appears in there, because in a way it builds a bridge to what you're doing. If you yeah. could, uh, talk about his connection to Billy and the early attempts to, to give him visibility. Sure. So I think just going back a little uh, more, uh, Billy, as they say, you know, life, nightlife had quietened down or maybe just changed tact. And no longer was he, uh, the sailors had left the town, business was drying up. So he, uh, as Paul Gordon described to me, he left all the files with Paul Gordon and said, I'm off fishing, which meant he was off to Port Nollis to die for diamonds. And, um, and he was gone for quite a long time, about a year or so. And in the meantime, Paul decided it was time to move on. And he moved to a little church in Wesley Street, which is still there, and became a studio or became his studio. And in time, Paul Gordon decided then he was going to leave for America. Um, and so he did a deal with Jacques to take over that studio. And the one thing that uh, Paul didn't take with him was Billy Monk's files. He just left them there. And there was no kind of, oh, by the way, there's some files there you might be interested in. It was just, they were literally one step away from the dustbin, which is what my whole thing is about preserving uh, endangered photography. And this certainly comes in the same category is that so luckily as the story goes um lynn sampson who was then uh, partner to jack de villiers who was also a very renowned photographer in his own right um pointed out the the files and they had a look at them and started to go through them and were suddenly taken with the potency of these images on in the files and as far as I understand, um, Jacques put a team together, Chris Ledichowski and Tony Mankies, and there might have been several other people, uh, to start um, curating or going through the files and putting a collection together, which they could then offer up as an exhibition. He had also spoken to Billy Monk, so it was uh, with his permission that they went ahead and did this. And he said to Billy, listen, we want to make an exhibition of your work, blah, blah. And Billy said, yeah, great. Uh, I'm not sure if they, they were face to face or this is long distance and he was still in Port Nolan. Uh, anyway, that's how it started. And um, so uh, David Goldblad, who was then um, another well-known photographer was heading up a, a gallery in Johannesburg and um, decided that there was a perfect subject to put on. So that was the one that went, took place in the market theater and that was the, the first uh, recorded uh, exhibition that Billy was supposed to be making his way to when he got waylaid and shot. It's at that time that Lynn Sampson, who I don't think had ever met Billy, uh, but had written the story. Mm. And it, um, it became almost cultish 
<laughs> so with that story, and now he's gone and shot me, and the contents and the pictures that were provided, Billy Monk was born. Um, there was, I know, at some stage, um, a small, uh, smaller exhibition at the uh, Zico called mm -hmm. Gozi, um, and uh, certain prints were donated to or bought by Zico, so they've got them on file. And then really nothing of any report until finally, I guess, Jack got together with uh, Michael Stevenson and they put uh, together the next leg of the journey. Um, and that was at the Michael Stevenson Gallery. Uh, and uh, from there, after that, it came to me. So that's kind of how it's followed a pattern almost uh, growing in this journey which has brought it to where it is now and I don't think uh, we've even begun the story personally I think we've laid the groundwork to uh, a man who was like an urban legend and will become even bigger you know and in the veins of people like other than the quantity of work that's the only thing as, um, as somebody said earlier in this interview uh, pity he wasn't still alive shooting because he probably would have amassed a fantastic portfolio of work. Mm. But as it turns out, he's, uh, he's, his complete portfolio only spans a couple of years. But having said that, it was a very impressive and unique collection, which I think has appeal, global appeal. Most definitely. It's not something, in fact, you know, it's, it was lucky that it was saved and lucky that he was around to invent it because anybody else who'd been out there shooting pictures, and maybe there were other photographers shooting at these venues, they certainly didn't leave that kind of a, a legacy that he did. So, um, so you know, I, I think our plight now with um, uh, Craig and myself is to really, and now with uh, the new association with Latitude, is to really get him out there into the global platform and uh, and grow legs and build up this legend. So maybe a question to both of you, but just before I ask it, listening to you speak, Gavin, it seems that in a way uh, the brevity of his career is also, it's, it embodies its perfection in a way because it's not sprawling, he didn't uh, sully it by <laughs> producing work later. You just have this small little uh, body of work that um, represents what he, you know, the totality of his output. Anyway, that's the sort of okay. arty Agreed. Agree. Um, a question around uh, photographic archives. You're not the first people to um, come across an extraordinary photographic archive. Um, if one thinks in the United States, there's Belloc who took the photographs of sex workers in New Orleans and they had a very interesting afterlife before they really um, were discovered. They even became the subject of a novel by Michael Ondaiki, Coming Through Slaughter. Um, that's one example. Um, one that I suppose was very topical recently was Vivian Meyer, who was the nanny who would shot this extraordinary archive and but it ended up in a lot of litigation between dealers and uh, disputes uh, around family members could you talk about some of the the difficulties but also the positives of working with the posthumous archive so Craig right. let's go to you yeah I mean I get asked that a lot you know what uh, how can we take a body of work that where the artist is not living and you know be true to it and sensitive to what he would have wanted thankfully in our case as opposed to Vivian Meyer who I mean according to the documentary that that was made about her and her, her archive it sounded as if she didn't want her photos to be put out into the world they were her private images and she didn't she wouldn't have wanted that luckily for us Billy Monk had aspirations to be a famous photographer. And so that makes that easier in that we're kind of fulfilling his wish after his death. 
And the curation, it's, it's helped by the fact that his meticulously labeled and, and filed contact sheets where they did have markups on them indicating where he thought he had a good shot and crossing out images that he thought uh, weren't good enough. So in that regard, I think uh, we, we're we lucky and we, we're doing things that uh, we, we're sort of guided by, by his mark, markups. Um, but yeah, it is something to be sensitive about and to yeah, to, to find a balance between uh, not exploiting exploiting his work, uh, but fulfilling what he would have wanted. And yeah, I think that it helps that that we do have all of these. Um, these Kevin, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I think um, let's say that opportunity knocks. Uh, as we as with Billy Monk. It was that close to his work being tossed in the bin. Mm. Now, maybe some divine power said, hang on, look at this shit before you throw it away. Okay. The same thing happened with Vivian Mai and her discovery of her work, a governess with a camera who roamed the streets of America portraying street life in Chicago and various whilst pushing a pram loaded with kids or with a couple of kids, okay? So every day she went out taking the kids for a walk, she would take her camera and she would aspire the moment of some situation she saw literally on the street that took her fancy or in some way spoke to her and she captured the moment. The strange thing is that she never, uh, or I say almost, yes, I think never, never printed a single picture that she shot and she never processed almost half as many pictures as she took and in fact what she did in the story it tells you how she one of her dictates of working for any family was that she wanted her own room with a lock and key <laughs> and the point of that was that she wanted to lock away all her, her films and her negatives and eventually when she did suddenly fall over and die obviously the family concerned uh, opened up the room and found all this stuff and where did it end up it ended up in a garage sale mm -hmm. for some guy to come along and offer four hundred dollars for that lot of stuff which nobody really knew what it had and in doing so, he un, uh, un, or he revealed this insane collection of work that I think has never been surpassed. It's unparalleled. The, the noise and the fuss about it, of course, is the fact that she wasn't around and everybody wanted a piece of it. Because it suddenly, the, the guy who discovered it, I put a lot of work into showing the extent of her, her creativity and uh, the measure of her work. Gavin, can I, can yeah. I interject there? Um, I think you, you make a point there that, um, about extraordinary work. And with the Billy Monk, the unseen that's showing at Latitudes, you're showing 10 unseen works. Um, yes. you know, I think often when one speaks about Billy Monk, one can get quite, um, let's say, caught up in the briar of his biography. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and it is enigmatic and extraordinary, but you know, the, the, so are the photographs. So, okay. um, well, the, the photographs are a mirror of his, his personality. They, they are him through and through. Nobody else. Let me take you on that there, Gavin. Um, let's, we, in, when we were chatting before this, I said each of you would select a favorite image. So yeah. uh, this one is yours, Gavin. Okay, well, to me, you know, I love lots of these pictures, but, you know, for the sake of this conversation, I picked this one, which is a, a new one to be included in the Unseen collection. What really grabbed me about it was, waiting for the moment 
okay? Not just snapping away, caught in surprise. It's almost like the whole composition of this shot is being worked out in an instant. And the, the button being pressed at the absolute opportune moment when this girl is either playing hard to get, not happy with her partner or not convinced by whatever he might have said or done to displease her, but it captures a whole sort of a, a story. So I'm not just looking at a picture, I'm going like, well, this is cinematic, it's cinema noir. What is going on? And where will it go from here? Because, you know, it's a still moment. But actually, it's a moving moment. It has a beginning and an end. We have to make up our own mind about where that began and where it'll end. But he caught a moment that seduces the moment, and that's why it grabs me. Hmm. Pleasing to look at. Out of interest, and when I looked at the photos, the, the sailors are wearing those Prussian sailor outfits. I mean, this is the late 60s. <laughs> you would have thought, I, I associate this with, uh, Villemin, Germany, you know, it's sort of pre-revolutionary Germany. Did you, when you were a young man in Cape Town, see sailors walking around with this kind of outfit? Uh, I guess I might have. You know, I came, I immigrated in 68. Mm. And I came to Cape Town sometime. I'm trying to work out the dates, but I can't. But I know that I came and spent some time in Cape Town working as a window dresser for True West. Uh, and um, and so I had an extraordinarily good time uh, and just being involved, which is actually when I first bumped into Billy Monk, mm. firstly, because one of the windows that I was uh, working on, it was close to where he was, you know, so uh, Long Street was a real Carnaby Street of its day. So, yes, one was aware that there were sailors because there was a big shipping industry going on uh, in the in the docks, uh, which I absolutely love. And we have a, a huge collection of uh, other photographers' works um, showing the docks and all that was going on and the people, etc. So, yes, they were definitely part of the game. And, um, and then all of a sudden, the docks became a ghost town. Did you go to the catacombs yourself? Uh, I'm sure I must have because I went to all the clubs, <laughs> so I would have not missed that one, you know. But I okay. don't know that, um, you know, I'm I'm not not as hardcore as that. I ended up dancing in a club in um, Lorenzo Marx on uh, trying to dance my way back to England. Uh, called the cave. <laughs> okay, let's leave it there because I feel we can open a door to your biography. Which <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, that, that would be akin to the catacombs. They were all the and everything. So another story. <laughs> Roberto, if you could bring up the image that Craig selected. Craig. So typically I am I'm more drawn towards the more cinematic shots where Billy spotted a moment that, and, and the subjects weren't aware that he was photographing. But for this one, which is clearly a posed shot, I just love it because it's got a lovely composition, this repeating uh, curve of the, the pillar, uh, of the archways and the slight curve of the, the model's pose. Um, and I just, he must have spotted this scene where these stacked up chairs gave this perfect gap he found, found a friend, a model, someone at the club, um, in this case, this lady is a prostitute and she pops up in quite a few photographs. And he just snapped this, this little scene. And the amazing thing is if you look at his contact sheets, this scene, it was a once off shot. He, he saw the scene, got, got her to stand there, took the snap and that was it. They were, they, he did try another take or rearrange anything. But then this is an example of, of an, a Billy Monk shot that it grows on you the more you see it and you, see, you notice details every time you look at it. What and, is the most uh, striking detail for you? Well, I love that. Like, so there's a few close-up crops. Um, yeah. I love this, the fact that you don't actually notice at first she's got a bandaged arm. 
<laughs> she's got these homemade tattoos on her hands. Um, it's, uh, I think one says love. It's, some of them are names of, of sailors, possibly. Um, and there on her on her left leg is it says Denise. I don't know if that's her name, but um, another homemade tattoo. And I, I love the details of the clothes that she's wearing. And then on her other leg, a plaster and another little tattoo. So who knows if she was if she it was involved in some sort of fight or why she's got a, um, a bandage and a plaster. Maybe it's covering a tattoo. Um, then just just the details of the clothing that the people wear in these clubs. Um, I don't know if that's leather or silk details in her pocket and her collar, her makeup, um, and then yeah, her shoes. I mean, all the all the little details. And then, as with most of the images, there's always. <laughs> on the floor, like in this case, a piece of corn and mealy. Um, there's always glass, um, broken beer bottles, some strange uh, liquids, like uh, I don't know what it is, but um, yeah, there's always these these details, and it's quite nice to have these high res scans of of the negatives to zoom in and and see what's going on in the scene that you you don't notice the first time yet. Have you, as, as a painter, uh, drawn on any of Billy's uh, photographs as reference for your own work? No, I haven't. But uh, last year on Instagram, uh, quite a famous American artist, Mark Tennant, he painted a famous Billy Monk scene. And I spotted it on Instagram. He didn't tag Billy Monk. And it was this one. And he did a beautiful oil painting of it. And I, I messaged him and I said, this is great. <laughs> Please can I repost this, post this on, on the Billy Monk page? And he replied and he was mortified. He said, I'm so sorry. Please don't you know, think that this is copyright infringement. I've already destroyed the painting. So I was quite sad about that because it was wow. a beautiful wow. piece of work. But yeah, nothing for myself. I haven't referenced it myself. Um, we had budgeted 45 minutes for the conversation. I see we've reached there. Um, I would like to give you both just an opportunity to kind of make a concluding remark. Maybe I'll prompt you. You don't have to go with it. Um, I recently worked on a fairly long essay for a book called 10 Cities. And it was about, uh, the book is looks at nightclub culture in 10 cities, five in Africa. Um, I worked on the Johannesburg. What I thought I knew about uh, the history of nightclubs was uh, very small as it turned out. And it was also very difficult to research because um, newspapers don't report on pleasure in the sense of on Monday, you don't get the news uh, report saying that, let's say in 1968, a, a group of South Africans and sailors had a good time at the catacombs. That, didn't, you know, was true of Johannesburg too. Um, and one of the tools that I kind of used for the essay was uh, photography. Uh, but even there, I found that, to my surprise, actually, there's not a lot of nightlife photography. It exists in private archives in the main. Um, you know, so that's why that thing you were talking about, Gavin, where these photos were made, but then mostly get jettisoned. You know, the only photographers who, of any stature, who were committed to photographing at night would be some of the drum photographers, uh, Jürgen Schadeberg, Alf Kamalo, uh, Peter Magubane. But, you know, there's such a huge absence in the, like, broader archive and do you think maybe that that's one of the reasons that there's such rapture uh felt towards billy monk's photographs because craig when we were talking last week you were saying that particularly people of your generation that would have been no what was it thunder.com where you go log on and see 
yourself partying, a very like uh, intimate sort of way of recording pleasure. Um, absolutely drawn to Billy Monk's photographs. You know, maybe the question to simplify is that what is it that gives such pleasure to the viewer? So can I, who would like to go first? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, as I was saying to you last weekend and what you touched on, the younger generation, they, they identify with these photos and they really enjoy them because although they're photographed in the 60s, they are relatable. The fashion may have changed and, and the hairstyles, but uh, there's a sense of freedom in this club in, or these clubs in particular, the, the dockside clubs. And I think Billy Monk captured that beautifully and yeah, people were photographed with their guards down, not just because of the clubs they were in, but because of the trust they had with Billy Monk and, and feeling of this community and subculture. Uh, so yeah, I, I find a lot of young people respond. I mean, most people respond very well to these photographs. There is a sense of joy and freedom in it, in them. And um yeah, like I said, it's, it's got to do with Billy as well. And also the fact that dockside clubs in general around the world, the, the police and, you know, authorities do tend to turn a blind eye to what's happening in the ports because the, the communities are so transient and they, they come and go and, and they kind of just let them have their space. But in the context of South Africa at the time, I think it makes them even more special and more just refreshing to see because we're so so used to seeing a certain uh, type of uh, photography coming from South Africa from that time. So I think it is a, a breath of fresh air and, and it's it's enjoyable to see what what was going on, you know, regardless of what's happening, pandemics or war or or segregation. I think there were always people wanting to just have fun and, and get together. Gavin? Um, just in summarizing, when I think of Billy Monk and what is the appeal to me, the first thing that we shouldn't take for granted is that for some reason he shot everything in black and white. So he never ventured into color, which is interesting. Was that because black and white was cheaper for him to provide? Probably. Uh, as opposed to color where he'd probably have to go somewhere to get the prints made, etc., etc. But when I think of Billy and that era and that time, I'm thinking of things like, uh, just here's an example, Andy Worrell, okay, and the factory. And that whole characterization of people that came and went, extraordinary people almost call it Fellini-esque anybody knows Fellini. Uh, to me, Billy, in a sense, brought the Fellini out of the catacombs. You know? uh, if I think of a lo another local photographer who left town 50 odd years ago and made an absolute name for himself, working on every pop star of any consequence in his studio in black and white, Norman Seif. He was a doctor at the time and he pulled out of uh, Johannesburg in 68 and never looked back. And he's, uh, he's famed uh, as a photographer worldwide. And all his work from the 70s uh, kind of reminds me of the speed at which, I mean, he obviously his library is a lot bigger and it's American and all of that. But again, he was another person who really brought home. So there is the romance of what Billy provided kind of, it could have otherwise been considered very sordid, but for some reason his approach and his attitude and the way in which he composed himself and his photographs and the fact that it's in black and white, which is always another thing that intrigues the world still today. Um, I think that's why he's left his stamp and uh, the universe saw fit to save it. Thank goodness. So it's an enjoyable thing, and I think it's also a kind of picture that, uh, that anybody could want to buy and put on their wall 
and enjoy it, looking at it every day. Mm. There's uh, a lot of uh, struggle type photography that's around that wouldn't do that. So I think this comes up as one of the, the all time great collections and everybody should have one in their home, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Gavin. I'm going to, there's one question that came through the public chat. It's from Nikki. So I suppose this one's for you, Craig. Uh, when and where will people be able to access the documentary? Is it available uh, freely online? Yes, currently it is available online. You can actually view it in the Latitudes viewing room for Billy Monk. And it's, if you go to the Billy Monk Collection Instagram page, it's always there in my bio, in our bio uh, to view on Vimeo. And you can view the full film? Yes, the full film uh, is still up on Vimeo. Okay, super. Um, there we go. Ruloff also points out it's on Vimeo. Um, I think we haven't had any more questions, so I'm going to step back from here. I just want to thank both Gavin and Craig um, for participating in the talk, for also drawing out some intriguing images from the archive. I think the one that really intrigued me is the outdoor photograph, mm -hmm. uh, the street view, where you see um, Billy shooting on the street. and um, the man on the right. Um, someone remarked that the photographs are quite tame. I think that that scene would have got you into a lot of trouble at that time. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, the photographs are not always as self-evident, you know, much like when you unpack that other photograph, there's so much details there. Because when I lazily first saw this photograph, I just thought it's uh, two women walking past the man. But yeah. Far, far much more going on in there and I'm also intrigued to see if there are more you don't have to answer that question that's part of I suppose unseen three if uh, <laughs> so Roberta I'd like to thank you for uh, giving us all an opportunity to talk about this fascinating photographer thank you Sean and thank you Craig and Gavin it's been amazing to insight into this incredible man and yeah, I see Laura Steed made a comment saying, simply awesome, thank you to all who have kept this legend alive. So just passing that on to you guys and hopefully we can do more so together to keep this legend alive. Thank and thank you to the viewers for coming. Yeah. yeah. We're competing with a lot of news at the moment. So thank you. Hopefully we've been able to yeah, add a bit of, in, in, inject a little bit of hopefulness into what's going on in the world and end the day on a positive note. So thank you, everybody. It's been wonderful and to have you all here. Happy birthday again. Thank you. Cheers, guys. And remember to go look thank at you. the viewing room on Latitudes. You'll get an email now with the link so you can enjoy those photos close up in your own time. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.